little introduction for Tim. He founded Engage in 1999 because he, he envisioned a society with transformative opportunities for older adults, spaces filled with enthusiasm and beauty, with creative programs and multi-generational housing. Tim's pioneering efforts have garnered multiple leadership awards, including the prestigious Stanton Fellowship from the Durfee Foundation. Um, and you can find his enlightening conversations with some leading thinkers um, at the Experience Talks podcast. And I'll put more info at the end in the chat about that. Um, welcome, Tim, and happy birthday. As you can see, um, <laughs> I have a birthday celebration on the screen. I brought some virtual presents for you. Thank you. It's okay. coming up. Tuesday, I turned 60 years old, so. Right, yes, how are you? I've been aging in place in my own job. <laughs> so tell us about that, about 60. Um, how are you thinking and feeling about that? I feel great. You know, I, I feel like I'm back to that uh, that place as a child where you, instead of saying you're seven, you're seven and a half approaching your eighth birthday because for the last year, I, I've been telling people I'm almost 60. So uh, I've been looking forward to it. And uh, it's, it's nice to pass a, pass a threshold like that working in the work that we do, you and I. That's right. It's a real milestone in our work, uh, a place of a privilege to, to make it to the 60 mark. So that's exciting. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, today, we're going to just explore a little bit um, about your experience with creativity, both for, from a work lens and what you've done to bring creativity to others, um, as well as you know how it has impacted your own personal life and identity. Um, so I wanted, we talked before and there was something you said that really stuck with me that I thought maybe we could start with, um, if, if you're okay, unless you have somewhere you wanna start, I should. Uh, you go, go for it, I'll follow you wherever you go, Katie. Alrighty. Well, let me jump in. You mentioned that arts programming and senior living serves as a mirror that we can hold up, you know, to that older artist. Um, and it really, to me, it tied into this concept that Ann Basting has in her creative care book, the idea of proof of listening, what it means to be seen and heard. Uh, I thought, could you speak a little bit about that, what that means, holding that mirror up through that programming? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, you know, for, for me, one of the things that, that brought me to this work was some of my personal journey. You know, I, I grew up a, a redheaded, freckled, overweight, shy kid, um, and I didn't always feel seen by people myself. And, and my grandmother, my father's mother, um, always saw me, and, and, and it was something that meant a lot to me. And then when the tables were kind of reversed and she was old, an older woman. She was a very simple, um, but kind of Mark Twain wise woman that when I was at, I, I spent the first two years of college at UC Santa Barbara, um, which as you probably know, and back then especially is kind of a Bacchanal club med surfer dude kind of school, not known for deep thought. And my grandmother would send me letters about her life and, and they were simple, but so pure and filled with wisdom um, that I read them. I, I, would, I would take them into the lounge on my dorm floor at UCSB and I would read them aloud. And at first, you know, it was just a couple of close friends, but it became this thing where people wanted to hear what my grandmother had to say. And she would, you know, pass on, pearls of wisdom. She would talk about corn and corn in my family. She would talk about when you pick a stalk of corn and you jog to the kitchen and the water's already boiling and you drop it in, that's fresh corn. But if you trip and fall, you have to throw it away because it's not fresh anymore. Um, and so my reading these letters aloud was for me this celebration of holding up a mirror to my grandmother and 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 I was shocked at how well received it was. And truthfully, that kind of became the work that we do. You know, the first thing I did running this organization, I've been a writer my whole life and I graduated as a journalist. Um, I knew how to teach writing. It was the only thing we had. We had me and nothing else in the organization. So I started a writing class 
out at a two story garden walk up senior apartment community in Duarte and went door to door and cajoled and and con people into coming to a writing class that I wasn't really sure how to teach. Um, but we immediately started telling stories, writing down stories about pe people's personal truth. Um, and and then we put it on stage. We got a community center and got people to read on stage and invited family members and and the mayor and community members and residents and and it was kind of transforming because no one was really doing that at the time. So that idea of creative aging and holding up a mirror to someone is really about our truth, our story, you know, and kind of getting rid of all the magical hoo-ha about being an artist, not being artists, you know, there's being an artist has all this baggage associated with it that you have to be special or magic. And I think all of us have art inside of us. We just don't call ourselves an artist yet. It's my, the way I think about it. Yeah, I love that reflection and actually have quite a bit of questions and thoughts on that, that as well as we get into some things later. Um, and I, I love the idea of like, you know, this young guy coming in and holding up a mirror, um, you know, to the older adults that you were working with and probably yourself in the process as well. Um, and someone, an audience member asked, you know, what prompted you to create Engage at a relatively young age? And you've answered that in part. Anything else you want to expand on in that? Yeah, I, I was working in healthcare. I, I worked in senior healthcare before I got into housing. I met a housing developer and he brought me to one of his communities and, and uh, said, you know, what would you do to change this place? And I came at it first from more of a healthcare perspective, but I walked in, went back and kind of went in by myself. And there was one older man sitting in the community room by himself. So I went and sat down next to him and just asked him, you know, what his life was like there, you know, kind of like a, the journalist inside me, just being open and curious about who he was and what he was doing there. And he was um, Preston Tucker's lead salesperson for the for a car called the Tucker Torpedo, which was portrayed by Francis Ford Coppola in the film Tucker, um, starring Jeff Bridges. And, and, you know, so he was connected to this wild man, this wild story. Um, John Bahari was his name. I'll never forget him. And, and I thought, holy cow, I, mean, I just walked in and the first guy I talked to was this walking myth and uh and i asked john what are you you know what are you doing here and he went over to the wall and he pulled the calendar down from the wall and he said uh, you know this is what we're doing here and we're dying here and there were two things on the calendar there were bingo on tuesday nights and donuts on saturday morning um and that was the moment where i thought you know one it, it's not a huge bar to jump over. So, <laughs> so I, I think I could do better than, than bingo and donuts. And two, I wanted to do something about this man. And again, like, like my grandmother, try and find some way to, to get people to notice them and, and, you know, take off the cloak of invisibility that we put over the older people in our society. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's so apparent now more than ever living through a pandemic about that cloak of invisibility over older adults, you know, in our society. Um, what's interesting is that stories have the power to lift that cloak, right? You know, it's, it really blows my mind when I think about all the stories around us, it's like just bits of gold, you know, like they're so valuable. Um, and there's something happening at Engage as a writing group, right? Throughout the pandemic, I believe it's doing a little bit of this work. Yeah, yeah. So at the, at the Burbank Senior Artist Colony, which is one of our communities, um, there's been a writing class taught by one of our master teaching artists, Sarah Jacobus. And it was really around the idea of writing at the pandemic um, and, and really journaling and writing stories and poetry and all kinds of different styles of writing um, and the group got together every week by Zoom and uh, Sarah put together this class in a book called 2020 Vision and uh, we published it as a literary journal and the 
show that you mentioned, Experience Talks, which we turned into a Zoom cast. We did a reading and Sarah was on there and just talked in general about the idea of, of what it's like, you know, to, to one, go through this thing. Um, because we're all going through it. It's not just older people. And, you know, I think everyone has this sense of, of isolation and loneliness, you know, and, and, you know, we've been told to physically distance from each other. I can't stand the term social distancing. I think it's one, it's incorrect factually. I, you know, we're, we need to stay physically separated from each other, but I think we need to do everything in our power to socially connect. Um, and so, you know, it was this great way for, for real people going through something real to tell their truth. Again, it's, you know, we own our truth, we own our story. And to put that forth as our art form to connect to others, it's, it's really the only way that I think is real. You know, I was so inspired by the work of Renee and Greg. Um, and it speaks to the same thing, the, the idea that that our creativity and our art form can help other people connect in times when we really need it more than anything else. Yeah, I think that concept is so beautiful and true. And it, it's one of the reasons, you know, we even have the symposium and, and all the work that you and I both do is really to encourage that as much as we can that everyone has the potential to express themselves creatively and you know it's a portal um people want to see who you are you know and it, it can really change the world it, you know i don't think it's melodramatic to say that <laughs> no no I, I think i mean timing wise we've just gone through a period where someone did that in one of the most masterful ways i've ever seen in, in the person of amanda gorman you know amanda gorman stood up you know she's an angelino she's from los angeles she's from where i live and i one of our master teaching artists was a mentor to her o'shea luja who came out of watts himself and got out of gangs because he was so good at words and so good at spoken word performance that he would perform at gang members funerals and they let him go they let him out because they needed his words yeah. um and amanda stood up there and stole the show. She had a speech impediment, just like Joe Biden did. She found her voice. She, you know, she, she went to New Roads High School here that was founded by one of my friends. She went to this writer's program called Write Girl and was coached by older writers to, to, to find her voice. Um, and that, you know, that, that, you know, her, her poem, The Hill We Climb, it's so one line, there is always light if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. You know, that, that's a moment where, you know, a young 22-year-old poet just stood up and stole the show because that's what we needed to hear. We don't need to hear political platitudes right now. We need to hear people's art. Um, and she's going to speak at the Super Bowl, you know, of all places, a place that's, you know, that Budweiser owns, you know, we're going to hear these wise words from this 22 year old. I think it's just a beautiful moment in time. Yeah. Oh, it just totally speaks to the need we have in our society. Like you said, there, there's a yearning, a craving um, for something that art and creativity can fill for us. Um, yeah, I don't think you that know, there's anything else it, like when, that. Yeah. No. No, those moments of, of connecting to ourselves and others, that's what creativity encourages, you know, the process of it um, just encourages such a deep connection. And that is what is life giving, you know, especially right now. Yeah, you've mentioned before, and you know, this is a pretty common refrain, I certainly believe this that, you know, creativity, art, it's about the process, not the product. Um, and you know, again, now more than ever, that is so true. And maybe tell us a little bit about that, like personally for you, about that sentiment process, not the product. Yeah, I mean, when, you know, I know that that's, a, that's an important part of teaching creativity and art to older adults, because again, you know, societally, we're taught to worship the product and things. Um, and if there's no product, there is no purpose. 
And to me, the purpose of engaging in creative adventure and, and expressing our truth and putting ourselves out there and, and being vulnerable with, with the way we see the world, that's the process of it. And, and at the end of the day, the thing to fall in love with is the process, not the product. You know, there's a, there was a study done by a wonderful doctor named Gene Cohen out of George Washington University, the first study on creativity and aging. And George, he was, Gene was a friend of mine, you know, fantastic guy, passed away a few years ago. He would do presentations on brain chemistry and he would use a lightsaber from the Star Wars movies as his pointer um, to just get out of people's heads, so to speak. And he would say something that always made me smile. He, he said that, that you fire the same neurons in your brain. You, you, you have the same leap of brain chemistry connecting neurons to each other when you write a limerick or a haiku that James Joyce experienced when he was writing Ulysses. Um, so the product, you know, is taken out of the picture. You know, the idea of just trying to, in your own way, practice creativity and art. And, and that is the key thing, you know, and, and I, I try and do it in my own life. You know, I, I have such a huge respect for Greg Pond and his poetry. I've been a writer my whole life and poetry is not my weapon of choice and, and kind of scares the hell out of me. And for the last year, I've been taking online poetry lessons with, with a writer named David White, who's this amazing poet out of the Pacific Northwest. And it, you know, it's one of the gifts of the pandemics that you can be inspired by somebody at that level because you can just do what we're doing right now is just connect on Zoom and not have to fly somewhere. And, you know, it, it's, it's been amazing to me. Um, and it feels, you know, like a risk. You know, creativity is also about risk taking. You know, it's about trying something new and again, laying yourself bare. You know, what we're trying to get at is the meaning of life. And there's no other way to do that that I know of that's like art any form of art, you know, own your story, own your song, own your dance, be in your garden, cook creatively, whatever form of creativity floats your boat, it all makes you feel like you're doing something that's elemental to, the, to being a human being. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. I mean, we could just put a bow on that right there. You know, it's so true. And it echoes earlier, Gabri was our first speaker and she just talked about exploring without judgment and like how that's so critical to create a process. And I'm hearing that, you know, if you can remove that judgment of yourself, you know, or maybe those voices you have about not being creative, you can take those risks that you're talking about. Yeah, we talk all the time about getting rid of the inner critic, you know, I mean, I think that the inner voice is, you know, one of our best friends and biggest enemies at the same time, no matter what that voice is talking about. So, <laughs> so the ability to kind of listen to one and not the other is an important habit to form. Yeah, you know, being selective there. Well, and something else you said reminded me when we last spoke, you gave me a couple of tips, um, which were actually incredibly impactful for me. Um, because you said, I think you, you had a um, writing instructor once talking about your gift, what your gift to the world is. If you, if you remember that, saying that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, they, I mean, he was, his name is Steve Mazur and, and taught a graduate course in screenwriting and and he talked about the screenwriting in a way that you don't really hear in Hollywood this idea that that connecting to the gift of the story is your way to approach how you how you create character and and try and move people and what you really want is to try and understand what the emotion you want people to carry out with them when 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 you're done with your story um, you know, I, I, I remember him talking about, and I've stolen this and used it in classes and, and, and things like this to try and inspire people, is you think about your gift and your story or your art or 
whatever it may be, as a diary that you keep about what you think about yourself, the way you see yourself, and you and think about it as what if your great granddaughter found that diary hidden away in the attic someday and opened it and read it and was able to connect to someone in their family that they didn't know um, and what that might mean to someone. So, so this idea that using your, your art is not just for you, it's also about giving your story to others and, and seeing the value in it. And, and again, you know, allowing someone else to, to see you in a way that, that people normally don't see you. Again, another thing that I, I only think that art can do Yes, yes, amen. I love that. Um, perhaps, you know, it leads me into thinking about those kind of tips you gave me about writing, particularly, but um, really, you know, the act of observation, um, you know, through these tips. And one of them was a book that you've been reading um, by George Saunders, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, right? Tell Great. me a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I, so a week from Tuesday, a week from my birthday on February 9th, I'm interviewing George Saunders on Experience Talks on my Zoom cast. So um, I, I'm very, very excited about that. But George Saunders is uh, one of the greatest living short story writers. Um, he won the Booker Prize for his first novel last year, Lincoln and the Bardo. He's one of the greatest writers alive, but he also teaches a class at Syracuse University. And uh, it's, it's all about exploring how to write through looking at the great writers of short stories in the Russian tradition. Um, so Swim in a Pond in the Rain is a line from a book called Gooseberries by Anton Chekhov. Uh, and the, the, the subtitle of the book, and, I, and this is like, I happen to have it here because I've been reading it and kind of getting ready for my interview. The subtitle of the book is called In Which Four Russians Give a Master Class on Writing, Reading, and Life. Um, and the thing I love is, you know, it's really about looking at these short stories. There's, there's several short stories by four great Russian writers. And then he talks about how do you look at a story? How do you read a story? How do you write a story? And every step of the way, make it make it better. Um, and so on the one hand, it's a guide to writing. It's a, it's a great guide to, to and, you know, one of the core principles is how do you get from one line to the next and get people to keep reading and not quit? I always thought that was like the simplest, greatest idea. Yeah. Um, but it's also, it's not just about writing. It's a, you know, it's, it really is this fantastic glimpse into life and reading and the beauty of reading. Um, and he's just, he's, you know, this incredibly kind, giving man. He gave a, 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 a the, the convocation speech at Syracuse University several years ago. Um, and instead of talking about what people should do with their life in terms of career and, and you've graduated and now what are you going to do? All he talked about was kindness. And he said, you know, the only regret he's ever had in his life are the moments where he lacked kindness. Mm -hmm. and, and so if we go out and be kind and in the introduction to the book, he talks about the fact that literature is this avenue towards reaching our own highest selves um, and that literature to a certain extent, great words can save us and, and create a pathway towards just being better humans. And I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I loved that. I, I so I read through the first, you know, book, I mean, excuse me, short story that he reflects and I'm into the second. And I thought, I am so glad you recommended this because it is really tangible, useful things about writing, which I super appreciate. But it also reads in these like, he'll just have one line about loneliness that blows me away. I'm just like, oh, we're not even talking about that, you know, and just boom, like just, you know, huge chunks of inspiration there. So I love that tip. I think I put it in chat for everyone um, to check out that book. I think it's, it's excellent. Um, you're right. It's an excellent just avenue into being a better human. Yeah. And yeah, you gave me another tip that I want to share um, in our last minute here which is about, I think a process, I don't know if you had this before COVID or not about taking walks in, 
in, every day? And yeah, or, when did that start? Uh, that's I, the the idea is 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 really around just just creating daily practice and creativity, and even in just in small ways. So you know, during COVID, what I've doing been doing. I live in Los Angeles, which has been the epicenter of the pandemic for for you know at least the, the last month or two. Um, and so I take walks. I do it safely. I walk around a park. I'm masked. Um, but I really try and pay attention to, to what's going on around me. I, I, I try and find ways to experience beauty in whatever it is that I'm seeing. And then when I get done with my walk, I try and write it down. I take photos. I listen to music. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's a very easy, quick way for me to enter this kind of wholly creative space um and and anyone can do it you, you know it's it's you know it's it's like gene said about the difference between a limerick and ulysses you know i think starting with just small creative practice and challenging yourself to experience beauty and again another thing that only art can do you know the, just listening to Greg and Renee, their, the beauty of their words, the beauty of her images, that's available to all of us. So the idea of just trying to create connectivity to that in small daily practice, I think it's like church for me. Yeah, I, I, I like that a lot. It is like church. And after you mentioned that practice, I started doing it because I, I was already taking walks and um, but, you know, it was like a call to observation, you know, on those walks that it really spurred something in me. And so I just, I mean, you know, these walks are no longer for exercise because I can't stop stopping and, you know, like looking at, oh, look at the light hitting that, you know, branch and this new growth and this old place. And I mean, it just, you know, I think once, you know, opening yourself up to just to noticing uh, that beauty that you mentioned, it just cascaded for me. And, you know, I found myself, you know, afterwards you mentioned writing down, just jot down some things you noticed, no pressure. Um, and that was turning into poetry for me. And just, you know, what a cleansing like practice, you know, to start your day in that way. So I, I really appreciate that tip for any anyone who can give that a go. I found it really impactful for my life. Am I writing? And it makes you feel good. You know, I mean, that's yeah. it's, it's one. You know, it's a, it's a, it, it's, it's so easy to link that to feeling good, feeling optimistic, being healthy. You know, they're, I think they're really connected. And at the end of the day, I think art is the solution to the idea that a lot of people have mentioned around loneliness and isolation. You know, it, 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 you know, what people want is is to belong. They want to not feel lonely. They want to feel meaning and, and community and neighborhood in their lives. And I think art is a really, it's the easiest way I know to get there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, just take that shortcut, <laughs> right, to connection through art. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, you know, it's just a pleasure speaking with you and thinking about how, you know, these, these small tips and ideas can impact us all. Um, and thank you for your work. You know, you really have, you, you were a pioneer that has changed certainly my job and the lives of many people. So we appreciate you. Same with you, Katie. Thanks for doing what you do. And I'm gonna tune into Greg's class on Well Connected. I'm, I'm looking forward to awesome. hearing awesome. more of his words. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you, Tim, and, and have a good day and happy birthday. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Alrighty. Well, we have arrived here at the end of our time together for the Creative Aging Symposium. Um, as inspired as ever, I tell you, every year I just I am so impressed by what people are doing out in the world. So hang in there with me one more minute because I have two challenges for you today to leave with as we wrap up. When I think about how creative expression helps shape a sense of self, which is what we've explored today, you know, I get a feeling like a sense of being rooted and the idea that the deepest parts of ourselves have an anchor to hold on to, maybe a childhood experience of creative freedom, a role model who showed us what it means to explore, you know, someone who sparked your imagination. 
I think of Gabri's mom and her doll and, and how a small object might have sparked this big new way of viewing the world. Um, I think about Renee and finding her place and her family and her community through the camera lens. Uh, and then in adulthood, she helps us see all the full humanity um, and the beauty there. You know, it's the will of joy that calls us to claim our imagination, to our joy, to find ourselves in moments of awe and then share that with one another. And it's Greg reminding us that we matter. You know, our very existence has altered the world. You know, what would it mean to own our ability, our creativity and make those small and large ripples of impact? It's Tim who teaches us that, you know, gentle observation of the world makes us powerful. It gives birth to imagination um, and new ways of seeing and is only art can do. So the first wrap up challenge today is to sit in that feeling of rootedness Remember the anchors in your life that um, have called you into creativity or imagination and bring that forth in yourself. Bring you, fully you, into the, the world. Lean into your unique expression of self. So that's challenge one. And then challenge number two is to continue this conversation with us. Join us at Well Connected for just a multitude of weekly conversations. They're inspiring and certainly bring fresh perspective. Um, and we also host Creative Spark classes on Well-Connected and Well-Connected Espanol. So in English or Spanish, you can join us and you can submit your creative work to the Enduring Inspiration exhibit you see behind me. Whether or not you join a class, we welcome everyone's ex creative expression into our virtual gallery. So I thank you all for making this event possible. And I certainly cannot wait to hear how today's celebration of creative, creative aging change, you know, the way you're thinking about something. So um, I'm gonna just put up on the screen for folks who wanna hang around for a minute, um, just how you can get in touch with us more at Cobia um, and at Well Connected. So let's do that now. So it's covia.org for those checking in to us. Um, there we go and have a lovely day and week.